Welcome to the Rocky Mountain MS Center's webinar series. This series is designed to give people with MS information to empower them to make the best choices for their lifelong brain health. I would like to thank the pharmaceutical companies that have provided support for this program. Thank you to Biogen, EMD Serono, Genentech, and Sanofi Genzyme. Today's presentation will share the results of the DISCO MS study with Dr. John Corboy. Dr. Corboy is the medical director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center and director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado. He is a, grad a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and did his neurology residency there with a fellowship at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He specialized in MS and neurovirology at the University of Minnesota Medical Center before coming to Colorado in 1994. In 1997, he founded the University of Colorado Multiple Sclerosis Center, now transformed into the Rocky Mountain Multiple Sclerosis Center at University of Colorado, a multidisciplinary group offering state-of-the-art care and research to multiple sclerosis patients. Dr. Corboy is the founding editor of Neurology Clinical Practice, the clinical journal of the American Academy of Neurology. This webinar features a lot of important information if you miss something on a slide or want to hear it again, we are recording this webinar and it will be archived on our website, mscenter.org, so you can replay it at any time. All live viewers will get the recording automatically sent to them. You will also receive a link to our evaluation survey. Please take a few minutes to fill this out as it helps us improve future programming. We'll reserve time at the end to answer questions from the audience. You can submit your questions at any time by typing them into the Q&A box on your screen. We will answer as many questions as time allows. Today's presentation is for informational purposes only. All decisions regarding MS treatment and medications should be discussed with your neurologist. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Corboy. Well, thanks, Kelsey. Thank you very much. That's a great introduction and uh, appreciate everybody getting on and spending a little bit of their Monday morning uh, with us uh, today. And uh, I'll give the talk and we had some pre-asked um, pre questions that I'll try and get to at the end as well, uh, but we may have some time after that as well for more questions. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to everybody's questions and um, uh, let's go from there. Let me uh, share my screen and we will um, get started here very shortly. And Kelsey, tell them if you can see that, okay? That is great. All right, perfect. So, um, so this will be the results of the DISCO MS study, that is the discontinuation of disease modifying therapies in MS uh, study. Uh, and uh, these are my disclosures, um, all related to research. Uh, I'm the uh, now former editor of neurology clinical practice, but I'm an associate editor for Annals of Neurology. Um, and that's a, a new change for me editorially. The objectives for today's talk are to have you be able to understand the rationale for potential discontinuation of multiple sclerosis disease modifying therapies as you age, describe the main efficacy or effectiveness outcomes of the DISCO-MS trial, and then to be able to use this information to make some informed decisions about the risks and benefits of continuing or discontinuing disease modifying therapies as you age. And as I think many of you are aware, prior to 1993, uh, this is what we had for MS therapies, that is goose eggs. We had nothing. We had no therapies that were proven to be effective. We had some that were used such as cytoxin and other chemotherapy approaches that um, uh, may have had some benefit in some populations of uh, MS patients, but nothing uh, broadly available in, in use and nothing FDA approved. But since then, we have had an incredible collection of patient of uh, disease modifying therapies approved by the FDA and other regulatory agencies around the world. And this is the complete list. Now, uh, a variety of others are under uh, study, many more than are just listed here. Ublituximab should be approved by September or so. And then uh, over on the bottom here are several of the so-called Bruton cyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are uh, a new class of medications uh, that we are very hopeful for that may be useful for multiple uh, types of multiple sclerosis. But this is a very different framework than when I finished my fellowship in 1992. And uh, the goals for the disease modifying therapies may be uh, 
uh, somewhat different for different patients, but ultimately um, several of them are listed here. And we always look at whether or not people are having new attacks or relapses, severity of those, those that require steroids or hospitalization, accumulation of new MRI lesions of, of multiple types, reducing progression of disabilities may be the most important. And then we have a variety of others that we have measured in a variety of different studies, uh, including something called no evidence of disease activity, that is no change on your exam, no change with relapse and no change with scans. Uh, and this has evolved over time and is used at the population level uh, and somewhat less so at the individual level in the office. But we'll be focusing on those that are highlighted in yellow here. And this is a big business. Um, uh, multiple sclerosis therapies, as I'm sure all of you are aware, are extremely expensive. And uh, the market has uh, grown substantially since 1993, with estimates that by 2026, it may be a $39 billion a year market, with about half of that coming in the United States. So this is a very large uh, business issue as well. And when someone is first diagnosed, or perhaps they're not yet on a therapy, uh, maybe haven't used one uh, as yet, there are a variety of different questions that arise with regard to the use of these medications. Uh, one is just, should I use it? Should everyone use it? And then perhaps it's not true, uh, perhaps it's true that not everyone should or needs to use a disease modifying therapy, but the landscape is that for your usual run the mill um, circumstance in which someone is newly diagnosed, especially with a relapsing form of MS, the most typical when someone's in their 30s or maybe early 40s, uh, probably the vast majority of those individuals should be uh, considering strongly the use of one of these disease-modifying therapies. And there are a variety of issues that come up. Um, how effective are they? Uh, what are the side effects? What are the long-term risks? What are monitoring issues? Uh, pregnancy is a very prominent issue, uh, given that uh, about two-thirds or more of our patients are, are women, especially young women in pregnancy uh, time frame. Uh, a big one is, of course, insurance issues and how much will be covered and what will be the responsibility of the patient outside of their usual costs for their insurance. But one question that doesn't come up as often when someone is newly diagnosed is, when should I stop using this or consider stopping using this? As people age, this becomes more of an issue, especially if they've had either a stability for a prolonged period of time or oftentimes if they have slow worsening uh, independent of relapses and in spite of taking their disease-modifying therapy. And we know that this is important because MS changes with aging, the pathology changes with less actively inflamed lesions uh, inside the nervous system and a change to uh, less repair capacity, for example, as they age. We know that clinically there are reduced relapses and less new MRI scan changes. And for some, uh, there's a transition to a, a phase where there's slow worsening of uh, disease disability that is seemingly unrelated to or very minimally related to new relapses. Um, there's also a diminished impact of presently available disease modifying therapies, and I'll go through that in, uh, in a little bit here. And then there's also potentially increased risk. Uh, we know there's increased risk with just infections and things as people age in general, and certainly as they age with MS, and especially if they are more disabled or on immunosuppressive therapies, but also cancer and other conditions, heart disease, other things, uh, that may limit the use of these disease-modifying therapies also increase as people age. So this combination would ask the question, um, when is it reasonable to consider a trial off disease-modifying therapies? And this is not a trivial question because if you look at the distribution of who has diagnosed MS in the United States, and this is similar in other countries, especially in Western Europe, uh, actually large numbers of people uh, with MS are actually well over the age of 55. If you look here, the most prominent epoch, if you look at the 10 year periods here, and this is a lower estimate on the left and a higher estimate on the right from Dr. Wallen and colleagues uh, a couple of years ago, you can see that actually 55 and older accounts for uh, actually about 46% of all people in the United States with MS. So this is a significant subpopulation of people who are relatively older compared to people who are diagnosed typically in their 30s and early 40s. And this is important because most of the studies that have been done, and this is not all of the studies, but this is many of the studies in both relapsing forms of MS as well as progressive forms of MS. Uh, these are the randomized controlled blinded trials, phase three trials that were done to get approval for the various different medications. And again, this is not all of them, but this is a large number. This is about 30 different studies. 
And uh, with relapsing MS, you can see that the mean of all these median ages, so the sort of average age of people in these studies was quite young at 36 with the top age being 55 in the majority of studies. And even in the progressive MS studies, well, we know patients are typically 10 to 15 years older. The mean age is only about 47 in all these different studies. And even when the maximum age goes up above 55 or 60, actually quite a few of these studies had a uh, negative outcome. That is the primary outcome measure was not achieved in these studies. So many people, um, you know, 55 and older have no significant guidance from these studies as to whether or not these medicines even work because mostly the patients weren't studied. So we would really like to have in relatively older patients, um, studies looking at efficacy as well as safety uh, in individuals say 50 or 55 and older, but we simply don't have those. But we do have from the randomized controlled trials, the RCT, we have subgroup analyses, including some individuals over the age of 50, but as, as we've already seen, many of those, uh, you know, people over the age of 55 are excluded. And we have efficacy data in these subgroup analyses, uh, but we don't have any safety data of any note in any of them. We can also look at intra-study comparisons, look at this study over here versus that study over there, some of which would have older patients in them. We can look at meta-analyses where you take uh, many different studies and put them into all one categorization, try and figure out what the subgroups look like from those. And then we have some observational studies where we can look at people who are either relatively older and they are staying on their medications and what the impact is and uh, a variety of discontinuation studies which are observational in nature. That is, they're not randomized controlled trials, but just database studies where people have information in a database and you can interrogate that database. And when we do these subgroup analyses, there are some significant limitations with different techniques that are used often what we refer to as a binary breakdown. They might look at people over and under a certain age, like say a breakdown of say above and below 40, as opposed to looking at say 35 to 40, 40 to 45, 45 to 50, et cetera. Uh, most of these are post hoc, that is they were not predetermined. And so statistically they don't really have um, significant relevance. You have to have pre hoc analyses for that. They don't take into account multiple things like age as well as maybe prior treatment or maybe disease duration at the same time to do a multivariate analysis. As I mentioned, limited any safety data and relatively short term follow up. So although they have some utility, there are some limitations as well. And here are some just examples of the types of things that you can look at. And this is with Nalizumab, Tysabri from the original phase three trials. And this is from uh, the AFFIRM study, which was the placebo control trial. And in these, uh, what are called forest plots, everything to the left would favor Tysabri, everything to the right would favor, in this case, placebo. And, uh, and you can see that when you do a breakdown, looking at people under the age of 40 compared to over the age of 40, um, and look just at the outcome of relapse rate, the individuals who were younger did better. They, that is, they're further to the left here. Uh, although certainly the group over the age of 40, so 40 to 55, did better than placebo, the straight line here at one, um, uh, there was a trend. And this trend is seen in numerous studies where younger patients did better than older patients. So even if it's still uh, statistically significant, you can see that there's a declining um, uh, benefit that's seen. And this is, this is seen in virtually every study. And if you do the same analysis and look at disability progression as opposed to relapse rate, you can see actually over the age of 40 in this particular study, there's no benefit uh, compared to placebo. This, is, this number is right on the placebo line essentially. And so consequently, um, uh, it's difficult to show that there's any impact of, uh, of this medication in this study on disability and progression. Now, this is a similar study done with cladribine, and I like to include this one because it has a couple of different things. One has two different doses, a low dose on the left, a high dose where the circles are on the right. And they looked at also not just age, where they showed the same trend as we've seen in other studies. They also looked at disease duration, uh, less than three years, three to 10 years, and greater than 10 years, and showed that exact same trend. There's probably an intersection of age and disease duration. They obviously vary together as people are older, they tend to have a longer disease duration. And so disease duration may play a similar role to age. Uh, other things that are important in a number of different studies are 
uh, in terms of impact on relapses or disability progression, in this case, impact on relapses, um, is what, do, what was happening with people beforehand? Did they have relapses in the year before? Did they have one, two, or maybe three or more? And the people who had very active disease benefited the most. Those with less active disease benefited less. We can look at the baseline status of whether or not there are active MRI scan lesions after the injection of contrast material with the dye leaking, you can see an enhancing lesion. And those with enhancing lesions, one or more, clearly did better than those who did not. And sometimes also it's relevant to look at uh, baseline, uh, what's called the, the EDSS, the disability score. The disability score from this EDSS is a zero to 10 scale. The higher the number, the more level of disability. Uh, this is a common cutoff that is used, 3.5, because three or lower, this comes in half unit increments, so three, three and a half, four, four and a half, five, et cetera. Um, three and below is generally considered uh, moderate at worst disability, and those people tend to do a little bit better uh, than those who are higher disability. These are typical findings um, for many different studies. Subgroup analyses, who benefits the greatest? Um, it seems then patients who are relatively younger, shorter disease duration, those with active MRI scans, recent relapses, and perhaps lower levels of disability is what we tend to see. And this was in a meta-analysis, as I mentioned before, with Dr. Signori from Italy. But what happens if you discontinue disease modifying therapies in an older person with multiple sclerosis? Well, we know that if you are a younger person who discontinues disease-modifying therapies after discontinuing, uh, uh, who discontinues a disease-modifying therapy, we have the same things that were related to benefit are also related to the, build, the likelihood of having recurrence of disease activity. That is, younger patients, those with recent relapse, scan changes, those are the ones who are more likely to have recurrence of disease activity should you discontinue. And all of these studies on the left, which are not shaded in gray, uh, were really just studies that were done uh, primarily um, uh, either randomly, for example, people had to go off medication when Tysabri was taken off the market, the O'Connor study, um, or some other studies that were planned studies, the Fox study, where they looked at people coming off Tysabri and transitioning to other medications. Um, but these were all done before our study was planned and put together. And then all the ones that were in gray um, were since the time that we planned and executed our study. And notably, a lot of these studies were done specifically looking at the question of what happens when you discontinue. The ones on the left uh, mostly were just done um, as part of natural experiments or just seeing what happened. Um, these were done deliberately to look at what happens with discontinuation. And I'll show some of the data primarily from these because this is relatively newer. And the best data amongst all of these um, are probably the next several slides. And this comes from Austria, uh, from a group in Innsbruck. And um, they were one of the groups that has a large database. They follow patients over time. Every uh, three to six months, they put data into the database. And then you can, and they put MRI data, clinical data, et cetera, into this. And then you can actually interrogate the database and say, okay, well, who's on medication? Who's not on medication? And look at the people who went off their medication. And in an original study, they showed that age at discontinuation, activity on MRI scan at discontinuation or within the last six months prior to stopping, and the duration of stable disease that is not having a relapse or a change in disability all independently predicted risk of having new disease activity, which they counted here as a relapse after discontinuation, a change in their disability score on the EDSS, or restarting their disease-modifying therapy. They called those sort of a failure of going off therapy. And they um, then gave a scoring system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And younger patients had a higher score compared to older. Those with activity on their scan had a higher score than those who did not. And by activity, they meant three or more uh, new little white dots on their scan or enlarged ones, or at least one active lesion. And then stability of disease uh, with uh, stable for a lesser time, having a higher score, stable for a greater time, having a lower score. 
And then they said, okay, if we give the score, what happens to people? And uh, here's the group that they looked at. And the mean age was pretty young. Uh, duration of disease uh, modifying use uh, therapy use was four years and others as noted here and had a fair amount of people that reactivated their disease as you might expect in younger age population. But when they scored them out, you can see that those with a lower score, older patients, stable scans, long time since last relapse or disability change, those who had a zero score or a one score up on the top here, they did very well. And this is individual scores of zero through five. And you can see that the likelihood of reactivation was tremendously larger in those individuals who had a high score compared to a low. And even when you put them together in sort of groupings of zero to one, two, or three to five, you can really see how they break out more clearly. They then validated this with <clears throat> another group in Austria and Vienna and showed essentially the exact same thing. So uh, this was the uh, primary study and then they validated in another group. Another way to do these kinds of database studies is to actually directly compare individuals who stayed on their medication, so-called stayers, and those who stopped their medication and then match them, so-called propensity matching. So this is not a randomized placebo controlled trial, but it's a way of matching people so you can actually compare what happens to them as they go through the database. And this is from France. And they looked at people all over the age of 50, the mean age was 54. The last relapse had to be at least three years ago. The mean was five years ago. The uh, level of disability was moderate at 3.1. And follow-up was up to seven years with mostly relapsing patients, some with secondary progressive MS. And they looked at likelihood of not having a relapse. And over that entire period of time, stoppers and stayers over the seven years and beyond uh, had no difference in likelihood of having a relapse in this population. So people who stayed on their medicine, people who stopped their medicine, no different. When they looked at disability progression, the likelihood of having a significant change on their examination, again, no difference with regard to disability progression. And I would just also note, if you look at about two years here or so, and the average age here is 54, there was roughly about a 15 to 20%, 20% likelihood of having a relapse over two years. So sort of keep that number in your head. And then the number of people had progression of disability was you know, in a similar range, maybe 15 to 20 years compared to 20% risk of a relapse in this population. So who's most likely to have disease recurrence if you discontinue disease modifying therapies? Pretty much younger patients, probably shorter disease duration, recent relapses and recent active MRI scans. The same people who benefit the most from using the disease modifying therapies. And there are potential benefits of stopping disease modifying therapies, reduced side effects, costs, doctor visits, monitoring, reminders that you have MS. And there's also potential risks the longer you go, the older age that you have with regard to using some of the medications, because we know that risk of infections and cancers and heart disease go up as people age. And several of the medicines that we use, including the more highly effective therapies, such as Tysabri, Gelenia, uh, uh, and then cladribine, uh, ocrevus, and lemtrada, uh, they have similar risks. We know that, uh, for example, with the fingolimod, gelenia, the risk of hypertension is with that medication. Well, that goes up with aging as well. Reactivation of VZV, varicella zoster virus, chickenpox virus, shingles, uh, all of these drugs are associated with that. We also know that that goes up with age as well. So there's a confluence of risks that occur with some of the, especially of the more highly effective uh, therapies. And so that plays a role, that risk may change uh, as you age and as you use a drug for a longer period of time. And we also know that patients' attitudes and doctors' attitudes about these medicines are, um, are uh, perhaps not uniform. Uh, but reflect the fact that when someone is stable for a prolonged period of time, there may be a reluctance to go off of their medication. So this is from a survey that we did, a uh, uh, survey at NARCOMS. Many of you may uh, participate in NARCOMS, North American Research Committee on MS. This is a patient-driven uh, uh, database that was actually started by my former colleague, Dr. Vollmer, now retired, and uh, now run by Dr. Fox at the Cleveland Clinic. And we asked a simple question of people who were over 55, were on medications, most of them relapsing, 
um, had a prolonged period of time since they had disease onset. Um, and we're typically still using old injectable therapies and asked, would you be willing to consider a trial off of disease modifying therapy? And what did people say? Two thirds of the people said they were unlikely or very unlikely, presumably reflecting the fact that if they were stable, there was a concern that if they went off their medication, it might be disease recurrence. It's a totally reasonable question. And based on the data that we had when this study was done and from the prior studies that I just showed you, we had some uh, data that suggested the likelihood of that you might be able to go off therapy as you're older, but we didn't have a randomized controlled trial that would actually directly assess this in an appropriate age population. So that's the genesis of doing this DISCO MS study was that we needed data that was useful for people that they could understand what the risks are when you compare directly people that stayed on their medication and those that went off their medication. So this is what we'd like to know if you went off. Would you have a relapse? Would you have new MRI lesions? Would you have disability progression? Would you have worse cognitive function or maybe MS symptoms overall? How would your quality of life be if you went off medicine compared to staying on? And would there be more or less adverse events? And this is the genesis, and this is the framework that we used for the discontinuation trial. So here is the data from the DISCO MS study. And it's, this is registered with clinicaltrials.gov, as all major studies are. And uh, we've now put this data into the uh, database. This was uh, uh, written by myself. Uh, we did this with 20 centers in the United States. Uh, enrollment occurred from 2017 to early 2020. And um, people randomized one-to-one -one, uh, by site. That is, each location uh, would have roughly the same number. It was controlled, uh, continue versus discontinue. That is, it was not one arm, it was two arms. It was radar blinded. The individuals who were saying, did you have a relapse or not, were blinded to whether or not you were on medication. The people reading the MRIs at the, at the Cleveland Clinic were blinded. Uh, with regard to uh, what your status was on or off drug. <clears throat> and the, the data center at the University of Alabama, Birmingham was also completely blinded. Relapses were determined by the blinded rater and not by some centralized committee. And that can sometimes play a role in what gets counted as a relapse. Uh, this was funded by PCORI and the National MS Society. PCORI is Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, National MS Society is the NMSS. That is, it was not funded by insurance companies. It was not funded by pharmaceutical companies. Insurance paid for everything pretty much in the study, however, except for the six month MRI scans, which are not considered standard of care. Um, but they paid for the disease modifying therapies. They paid for all the other MRI scans. If there was monitoring that was done, this was all done as part of what we would then call a pragmatic clinical trial, where we used the baseline of what people were normally getting. We added in one extra six month MRI scan, and then a variety of outcome measures that we'll discuss in a minute to then try and analyze what happened to people over time. And uh, that's the way it was done. There were every six months clinical visits, brain MRI scans were done at baseline and we call baseline either right when the study started or anything up to six months prior to that. And then at six, 12 and 24 months with the six month non-standard of care paid for by the study, and the 12 and 24 month scans paid for by insurance. We ultimately had to adjust. Some patients did not make it out to 24 months, only made it to somewhere between 18 to 24 months because we had a contract with the quarry that required us to finish by a certain time. And uh, so for a small number of individuals, uh, the study got truncated between 18 to 24 months. But as I'll show you in a minute, the average amount of time in the study was 22 months. These were the primary outcome measures. And we, the primary outcome measure was any new relapse as, as determined by the blinded rater and or any new brain lesion on the scan as read at the Cleveland Clinic. Secondary outcome measures were change in disability, the worsening of the EDSS confirmed six months later, and looking at also the mean change in the groups of the EDSS over time. And then the tertiary third level where SDMT, which is symbol digit mentality test, which is a cognitive study of visual, uh, of, uh, visual processing speed, uh, NeuroQual quality of life measure that was a validated measure from the NIH. And they have a short form that we used. Uh, the MS impact scale, which is a symptom scale uh, 
as well as symptom MS screen, which is another symptom scale. And the PDDS is a patient desert, uh, determined disease step, which correlates very highly with the EDSS, which is determined by the actual uh, rater. So the, we did a rater blinded one as well as one determined by the patients. The Danish Center was at University of Alabama, Birmingham. And the statistics here require a little bit of a discussion. Uh, most studies uh, that you're probably used to hearing about, we might compare a new drug to placebo or a new drug to an older drug that's already approved. And we try to, and the hypothesis is that they're, they're no different from one another. And we try to prove that one is superior to the other. And that's what the way the statistics are set up. And those are called superiority trials. This was an inferiority trial where you try to show that a new drug or a new treatment is not inferior to what the standard of care is. So it's, a, it's like a flip-flop, it's like backwards and then the way we normally do this. And so here, the hypothesis is that discontinuation actually is inferior, but we try to show that it is non-inferior. And so, as I'll show in a second, we use a, what's called a cutoff uh, range of 8% uh, inferiority margin for the primary outcome. So that's meaning that anything that is greater than 8% worse uh, compared to those who are still on drug would be considered significant. And we did an intention to treat analysis. That means we counted everybody. So even people that uh, maybe got into the study, if they didn't fulfill criteria, they just got in somewhat by accident or other things like that, we would do an intention to treat analysis, including everybody. We also do a per protocol analysis. That is an indiv individuals who've fulfilled all the criteria for the study. Uh, and when we did that, I'll just tell you now that the outcomes are the same. So all of the things I'll describe were in the intention to treat analysis. And so how is a non-inferiority study different from a superiority study? In a superiority study, the null hypothesis, the basic hypothesis is that the treatment is equal to the control. We try to disprove this and show that it's superior, the new treatment is superior. This is the opposite in a non-inferiority study. The null hypothesis is that the treatment is actually inferior. And we try to disprove this by showing it's non-inferior within a very specific preset margin of difference. You can't decide this after the fact, you decide it ahead of time, and that's what you go with. And the non-inferior margin represents the maximum reduction in effectiveness that you would be willing to accept and say, yeah, it's close enough. That, that's within the realm of what I find to be essentially equivalent while still considering the treatments then to be equal. And you can see what that means here. So we would have what we call a non-inferiority zone. And so here in the non-inferiority zone, we, we predicted that we'd see about 2% likelihood with the primary outcome measure of having a relapse and or a scan change. And if we have an 8% margin, that would mean up to 10% would be considered within that range. So anything that had their primary outcome, the average number, whatever the number was, the measured outcome percentage, in this case of people with a relapse or a scan change, that was less than 10%. And the error margins around that, the confidence intervals were within this in non-inferiority zone would be considered non-inferior. Conversely, if you had an outcome that was completely outside the zone, including the error bars or the confidence intervals completely outside this non-inferiority zone, this has been shown to be inferior. So it's not only not inferior, it is actually proven to be inferior. You could have an outcome sort of in between though. That is, the number itself is within the non-inferiority zone, but the error bars, the confidence intervals, that is the 95% confident confidence intervals, if you did the study 95 times out of 100, you would expect a result to be within this range, the green arrow, uh, the green range here. Um, and notably though, the confidence intervals are outside of the non-inferiority zone. So some percentage of time, and when you do this test, when you do the same experiment over and over again, would be outside of the non-inferiority zone. So the confidence intervals, the degree of confidence we have that this is a reasonable result are actually outside the zone, even if the average that we see is inside the zone. So it's an in-between, not exactly sure what the answer means. And why do we choose a non-inferiority margin of 
um, we didn't have a lot of guidance as to what the likelihood of having a new event would be that is a relapse or a scan change. Because as I mentioned before, mostly we don't have data in people over the age of 55 or so. And so we expected though to see some ongoing inflammation and we did expect to potentially see some modest increase in disease activity in individuals who went off their medication. And so we felt that this was a reasonable amount that is, we projected 2% for a new relapse or MRI scan activity and clinically relevant would be 8% or 8% more or a total of 10%. We felt that that would be a reasonably clinically relevant amount. We also know that that would give us a, a, a statistically adequate amount of what's known as power with our sample size to reject the null hypothesis to actually show that discontinuation was inferior or not inferior. If we had a lower margin, say if that margin was 3%, not 8%, uh, then the maximum difference would be um, 2% going up to 5%. That would require a much higher sample size to maintain statistical power and would be a much more expensive study to do. So we used a margin that balanced statistical power with clinical relevance and feasibility. I mean, how many patients could we actually enroll? What were the amount of dollars that were available? So here are the participants in the study. Uh, to get into the study, you had to have following the inclusion on the left, and you couldn't have any on the right to be uh, exclusion, uh, so you wouldn't be allowed to be in the study. So it could be any MS phenotype, relapsing MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, we included everybody, 55 years of age and older, and we chose this based on some of the studies that I mentioned previously, because we wanted to look at this population and knew it was a large population of MS patients. No relapses for at least five years, no new MRI scan lesions for at least three years. Continuously using an approved therapy for five or more years. And these had to be drugs approved by 2017 in order to people have people on the drug for a long enough period of time. And they had to be on the most recent disease modifying therapy for the last two years. The logic being, we didn't want people to switch their medication multiple times they'd be more likely to drop out. We wanted people who were stably on their medication. They had to get at least 75% of all the doses. They couldn't be off their medications for more than a month. We know that many people have insurance problems or other things like that that might interrupt their care. So we took that into account, but no longer than essentially four weeks with the exception of natalizumab, tisabri, that's only taken every four weeks. So they could miss one dose and they could go out to eight weeks. They had to be able to consent, willing to be randomized. This was important. People had to be willing to go either way, either stay on their drug or go off and they had to be uh, able to follow the protocol. They would be excluded if they use non-approved disease-modifying therapies in the last five years, especially study uh, therapies. If they'd had uh, systemic steroids for MS in the last five years, suggesting they may have had a relapse. If they had more than one course of systemic steroids for a non-MS reason, they were also excluded. If they had other neurologic disease that might mimic MS because it would be difficult to tell was a new symptom due to MS or something else, and if they had other issues as noted here, especially for example, uh, cancers in the last five years. And this is the enrollment. Um, and we screened uh, over 5,500 individuals and excluded uh, over 5,300. The majority just simply didn't meet the criteria. Uh, and they perhaps were, uh, had had a relapse in the last five years and had a scan change within the last three years, or perhaps we couldn't find their MRI scans if. Uh, if they were new uh, people's practices. And um, ultimately we were able to enroll 259, 128 in the continued group, 131 in the discontinued group. And you can see the breakdown on uh, people who had early withdrawals uh, as well as um, perhaps uh, were lost to follow up. Um, we had a significant number that finished early, as I mentioned, 12 in the group here uh, who's uh, finished before the full 24 months and uh, 10 on this side. And um, we did have a couple of deaths in the study. This is an older age population, uh, not totally surprising. And then people who withdrew early are noted here. More people withdrew early in the continue group, uh, notably because they uh, were not compliant, that is, did not continue to take the medication. Uh, they had more adverse events. Uh, that forced withdrawal. Uh, eight people had financial issues related to their insurance. That was clearly not an issue if you were in the uh, discontinued group, but eight people in the uh, 
having to discontinue participation because of that. And four people, compared to only one in the continue, discontinued group, uh, stopped using therapy. Um, one person who was randomized to stop therapy actually went back on their medication. But all of these represent sort of complications of using the medication or cost issues. And there were more in the continued group than the discontinued group. And then there were some enrollment errors. And these were all actually relatively quite trivial. Uh, and when, as I mentioned, when we did the per protocol analysis, there was no difference between that and the intention of treatment analysis. So this is the demographics of who actually got into the study. And, um, oops, sorry. Um, and uh, the mean age was 63. And we'll focus just on the, the group in the middle here, the entire group. And then there's the continuum and the discontinuum to the right. Uh, because there were no differences between uh, the groups uh, when they were randomized. And this is why you randomize. So you have equal groups on both sides. Uh, about 83% women, uh, mostly almost 90% were uh, white. Years since symptomatics at over 22, years since last documented relapse, 13.9, almost 14 years. EDSS, the amount of disability on a 10 point scale uh, was moderate at 3.4 and similar in both groups. Uh, most of the patients by far were uh, individuals re with relapsing remitting MS. And this is the breakdown of the medications that were on. And you can see that the majority of individuals, uh, when you take uh, both uh, groups of interference and glutarium uh, copaxone, the majority, over 70%, uh, 72 or so percent, were still using the older injectable therapies, much smaller numbers. Uh, using other medications. The other major group was dimethylfumarate or Tecfidera was the other primary group that um, had the uh, medications at baseline. And the length of follow-up, as I mentioned a moment ago, on average was 22 months. It was a little bit more in the continue versus the discontinued group. Um, you sort of have a normal number of dropouts uh, in the first uh, 12 months. These are individuals who uh, for example, as I mentioned, um, if they randomized to stand medication, they may have said, I don't want to do that. And then they um, went off their medication, things like that, or were lost to follow up. Um, and these are sort of normal dropout numbers. And then this, uh, the 18 to 23 months, uh, these individuals represent those who are enrolled relatively later in the study and simply didn't make it out to 24 months. But as you can see, the majority made it out to 24 months. Uh, and uh, a significant majority, uh, well over 90% made it 18 to 23 months, or 18 to 24 months, excuse me. And here's the primary outcome measure. Uh, so the combination disease event, having a relapse or, and or a scan change occurred in 4.69% of people who continued therapy, this is six out of 128, and here are the confidence intervals that is, if you did the test 100 times, 95% of the time, it would occur within this range. And here's the discontinuum. And so there are 16 individuals, or 12.21%, and here's the confidence intervals, that had either a new relapse or a new scan change. When we tried to determine if this was inferior or not inferior, um, we could not show it was either inferior, and we could not show that it was not inferior. So this was the in-between result. So we, it was not proven to be non-inferior. It was not proven to be inferior. So the number itself was well within the non-inferiority zone, but the confidence intervals that if you did the test a hundred times, some percentage of those times, you'd end up with a result that showed that it was looking like it was inferior. So this was somewhat of an in-between result when we reanalyze this, so this was non-inferiority was not demonstrated. When we looked at just relapses alone, there was one in the continued group and uh, three in the discontinued group. This actually was not, not inferior. There was no statistically significant difference between the relapse in continue versus discontinued. When we looked at just the new T2 lesions, again, using that 8% margin, um, Again, we could not demonstrate non-inferiority and by definition also could not demonstrate inferiority. So the clinical outcome relapses were very rare in both groups. And here uh, is a breakdown on what 
these, this primary outcome measure, the combination relapses and or scan change, one relapse in continue, three in discontinue, and then participants with uh, MRI scan lesions, one individual, this 14 and three shouldn't add up to 16, should add up to 17, but one person had a relapse as well as scan changes. In fact, that was the person who had five new lesions on their scan. But most individuals, the primary outcome, the most important primary outcome that was achieved was having one or two new dots on your brain scan and 15 total of the 22 had just one or two new dots on their brain scan, 10 in this group in the discontinuant five in the continued group. And very much smaller numbers had significant number of lesions beyond that. And again, a small difference, but not statistically different in relapses. Here are the individuals who actually had a relapse. Only one of these, this person here, actually had scan changes in association with their relapse. As a younger person, a relatively shorter time since disease onset, a relatively shorter time since last relapse, and relatively low EDSS. The other three uh, uh, did not have scan changes in association with their relapse. Two of them were relatively uh, quite older, had a long disease duration, 24 and 32 years. Um, and um, uh, we always know when we are in clinical practice, as well as when we are in a clinical study, that it is difficult to sometimes determine if this was a true relapse or a pseudo relapse. I, we accepted the word of the individuals who did the studies, the blinded observers, um, that these were true relapses, but the fact that they were not associated with relapse, with um, scan changes, and furthermore, were not associated with uh, changes in disability, at least raised the possibility that three out of these four may have actually been uh, what we call pseudo relapses. That is, you have an old symptom that comes on, um, uh, perhaps with an infection or with some other stressor. And then when you treat the infection or, or get rid of whatever the stressor is, you go back to your baseline. That's what's referred to as a pseudo relapse. We don't know if these are pseudo relapses or not. We tried to uh, make sure that they were true relapses, but the fact that none of them had EDSS changes, disability changes, and none of these three, except for this one, the fourth one, none of the other three had scan changes, at least raises that as a possibility. And interestingly, I'm not sure what this means, but three of them, the individuals were taking tecfidera, dimethylfumarate, one on tisomerate. If we look at the individuals who actually had, you know, the 22 individuals, six here and 16 in the discontinued group who actually had an event, they look pretty much similar to one another. Again, there's no significant differences, <clears throat> excuse me, between the two groups. And they look about, you know, the same, slightly, maybe a few more males uh, compared to the number of males in the study. Um, but, you know, most, mostly uh, white women, um, as because they're the most common in the study. Years since onset, 22 years, almost identical. Interestingly, a little bit a lower number, but not statistically different in the continued versus the discontinued group. And time since last relapse, again, a little bit lower, although not statistically different uh, between the two groups here. And then the outcomes by the different, um, by the different drugs. Notably, um, not surprisingly, the vast majority of people uh, who had these primary outcome measures achieved were people with relapsing remitting MS since they accounted for 83% of the population overall. Um, and they accounted for uh, over 90% of people with relapses or scan changes. And if you look at the group with activity compared to the overall group, and of course, this is a subset of this group, they're, you know, they're minimally younger, uh, et cetera, but they're really, they're much more alike than they are different. Uh, and there were no statistically significant differences uh, here. We can also look by the likelihood if you're on drug X, if you, uh, the likelihood that you would achieve the primary outcome, that is you would have a relapse or a new scan change. And these numbers are small. So here's the six events that occurred in the continued group. Here's the 16 events that occurred in the discontinued group. And the numbers are quite small. So you can't really um, show that one drug did worse than another or anything like that. They, they just, um, not statistically enough individuals to try to break that out. And 
so consequently, it's just notable to look to just sort of generally see what the numbers look like. When we looked at disability progression, the EDSS score, um, this was not done by non-inferior. This was simply as one different from the other. And we have the continued group versus the discontinued group. And you can see their baseline disability score is about the same. And then over 24 months or 18 to 24 months, there was minimal change in either group. And none of these were statistically significant. These were almost identical between groups. So not only were there very low relapses on drug or off drug, but there was really minimal change in disability on average in the groups. If you look at the people that had confirmed disability at six months, that as you measure them at the baseline, there would be a change, say six months or 12 months later. And then when you check them again, six months later, that same change persisted, it is confirmed. That's what we're counting here. And the number of people with confirmed disability progression was almost identical in the two groups. So it was a little bit over 11%, a little bit over 12% in the discontinued group versus 11% in the continued group. And so consequently, there was really no significant difference between them. So by relapses, no significant difference. By progression of disability, no significant difference. And again, the demographics at baseline of the individuals, the 14 in the continued group, the 16 in the discontinued group, um, uh, we really see that there's no significant difference uh, between the two groups. I highlighted here in red bars one interesting phenomenon. Um, obviously, most of our patients, 83%, had relapsing MS coming into the study. The exact same number of, uh, almost identical number of individuals who had progression of disability was 83% were relapsing remitting. Um, and so uh, nobody with primary progressive MS and only uh, five patients with secondary progressive MS actually had um, progression of disability. So these are individuals that in spite of the fact that they had relapsed and remaining MS and were not having relapses, did show a change with regard to progression of disability, suggesting the possibility that they uh, either were misclassified as having relapsing MS and maybe had very subtle slow progression, which when we measured in the study, we could detect. Um, and so um, not clear what this means, but uh, exactly, but it was, it's notable that so many of these, um, the same number of pe as people in the study, 83%, uh, actually had progressive disability. And then by drug is also noted here, again, with no statistically significant differences. And if you look at the risk of confirmed EDSS worsening by drug category randomization, these numbers are virtually identical from side to side. You know, one might be slightly better in the continued group, one might be slightly better in the discontinued group, uh, but overall, um, no difference uh, that you could detect because the numbers were relatively so small. In order to detect something statistically between two groups, you have to have more events, and there are just not very many events here, especially when you break it down by the individual drugs. And one important question would be, was there any correlation between these two major outcomes? That is having um, either a relapse or scan change, the primary outcome measure, and relationship of that to progression of disability. And in fact, there was no relationship. Um, so individuals had confirmed EDSS progression, disability progression, and new activity, only two of those 30. And, um, in addition, uh, amongst the 226 who we had the data for all of them, um, 206 had neither. And so when you do what's known as the Fisher's exact test, there was no correlation between having a relapse or a scan change and progression of disability. And notably, the two people here with new activity, they had scan changes, but not uh, a relapse. It was, it was known that at the time we were doing the study that many people were not getting gadolinium, the dye, the contrast, um, as part of their routine screening for MRI scans. So we deliberately did not uh, include gadolinium enhancement as part of our primary outcome measures. But we were still interested in this question, and we asked people who participated to actually get gadolinium with their studies. Uh, but as you can see at baseline, uh, at the bottom here, only 59% actually had with their baseline scan that was done in the community, 
uh, had gadolinium on their scans, 40% didn't. Uh, at month six, we did a little bit better, 83%, but it deteriorated down to essentially the same number, a 58% versus 59 here um, at month 24. That is, people were just not getting dye. They could choose not to get the dye. We asked them to get the dye, but if they didn't, we still did the test without the dye. So this is, there's limited data on the impact of dye, but notably six individuals did have gadolinium enhancing lesions. All of them occurred in the group that discontinued their disease modifying therapy. In four of the cases, they had a, uh, a regular little white dot on their scan at the same time. Interestingly, two people did not have what we call the T2 lesions, uh, but did have a gadolinium enhancing lesion. Usually there's a one-to-one -one correlation if you have a gadolinium enhancing lesion. If you look without the dye, you can also see it, but two of these did not. But here's the six. And just looking at what did, who did they look like? Average age was 62, um, 63 almost. Uh, years since onset, 18 and a half. Years since last relapse, almost 11. Uh, baseline level of disability, pretty much the same as the entire group on average. So they look pretty much like everybody else uh, in terms of um, uh, what their baseline demographics were. And so there was nothing that's, uh, that's really stuck out here. If we took those, these two individuals here that we didn't count before as having a new brain MRI lesion because um, they only showed it when you used the dye, if we added that, did that change the outcome measure? Uh, so that if we added those two people to our primary outcome, that is because they had an MRI lesion that was not previously counted, that would make this number go up to not, um, so the number here would be the same, six individuals, all these numbers are identical to before, but we now have uh, 18 individuals over here and we still would not be able to show non-inferiority. We couldn't show inferiority, nor could we show non-inferiority. Uh, this does not change because there are no uh, relapses that change. And even just adding those two people here, we still could not show non-inferiority or inferiority for that matter. So adding the two patients who had the gadolinium enhancing lesion separately didn't change the outcome measure. So in terms of um, this monitor uh, uh, of no evidence of new disease activity or NIDA is the term we use, that is individuals with no relapse, no confirmed disability progression, no T2 lesion and no GAD lesion, we had 185 people that we could um, get information from for all of those and looking at all participants, those who continued and those who discontinued. And this is a very post hoc analysis. We, didn't, uh, we don't have statistical significance monitored here, but more people who continued their therapy um, did have no evidence of new disease activity compared to those who discontinued. But again, almost all of this was from just the little white dots of one to two new lesions on the scans. No clinical differences were noted. We did then look at the cognitive function with the SDMT, single digit modality test, and a variety of patient reported outcomes, just quality of life and other things like that. And there was a single difference in one quality of life measure that was slightly worse in a group, uh, the group that went off uh, drug uh, compared to those that stayed on. So of the 20 different comparisons that were made with the SDMT and with a variety of different patient reported outcomes, essentially there was no difference between them. Um, with the exception of the one that was noted here. And when we looked at serious adverse events, SAEs and AEs, adverse events, if you look at the number of individuals with adverse events, it was almost identical in the two groups, 109 in the continue and 104 in the discontinue. Um, serious adverse events, at 20 in the continue and 18 in the discontinue. And there was one death in the continue group and two deaths in the discontinue group. None of these were related to, of those three deaths were related to study procedures. They were just from other unrelated issues. So there were no, there's no significant difference in individuals who had serious adverse events or adverse events uh, in the study. So that's the data. What are the limitations of the data? Uh, well, this was mostly white women. It was all in the U.S. So, you know, we can't you know, let's just say that, say that this would be in every population throughout the world. Obviously, it's only in the group 
of people that we studied here over the age of 55, et cetera. Relatively short-term follow-up. We'd love to have a five to 10 year follow-up, but we don't have that. Um, we are gonna do an extension trial uh, that will include a subset of individuals here uh, and trying to get a little bit more data uh, extended out another year. Most participants were using older injectable therapies. So we don't really have a good idea of whether or not uh, we'd see the same outcomes when people were using Ocrevus or Tysabri or even Gelenia or some of the newer medications that will be coming out sooner, uh, uh, later um, as time goes on. So uh, most of this was related to individuals who have been stable for a prolonged period of time. The small subgroup analysis, uh, numbers don't allow significant subgroup analysis, for example, by a different drug. So I can't say that one drug did worse or better than another. Uh, this is a, pr a pragmatic study. That is, as I mentioned, we relied on insurance to pay for the drug and pay for uh, monitoring, et cetera. Um, and uh, also occurred in, in a large chunk during the pandemic. So there was some missing data that occurred as a result of that, although we scrambled quite successfully to get as many of the outcome measures done uh, and did a, an outstanding job and all the groups in the different sites really did a tremendous job under very difficult circumstances. Because the brain MRI scans were done differently in different sites, we couldn't do any brain volume data. We know that brain volume shrinkage of the brain is important and it's related to disability, but we couldn't do that because they were not done on all the same scanners. We also didn't have any biomarker study. There's a lot of effort being spent to look at markers in the blood that might be a more sensitive measure of recurrence of disease activity. So NFL is neurofilament light. This is a protein that's uh, part of the axon, the cable connects one nerve to another nerve. And uh, we know that damage to the nerves or damage to the axon, you can see leakage of this into the spinal fluid and now with better sensitivity, leakage into the blood. We couldn't do that because we didn't have enough money for that. And we also started the study early enough that this marker was really not uh, easily available. And, um, and so um, getting the study actually done was not functional. I'm going to mention a couple of other studies that are uh, ongoing that are similar to ours uh, in Europe, and they will be measuring these biomarkers. So our overall conclusions for the DISCO-MS population study that we looked at here uh, is that this is the first and so far only controlled uh, disease-modifying therapy uh, treatment discontinuation trial. And although stopping disease-modifying therapy was not inferior to continuing, we also could not show that it was non-inferior. So we had this in-between result. We couldn't, we couldn't show non-inferiority, but it was clearly not inferior by our predetermined 8% margin of inferiority difference. Newer or worse than clinical activity though, as I mentioned, was very low in either group. So really just a small number of relapses, not even sure if they were all even true relapses, uh, very similar numbers with regard to disability progression. And most of the differences that we're seeing were just in one or two new dots in a brain scan and the clinical significance of this over time is not clear. Uh, DMT discontinuation was not associated also with difference in adverse events, MS symptoms, or quality of life. And the rate of disease activity overall following the disease modifying therapy discontinuation was low in the study pa patient population as we anticipated. There are two other discontinuation trials, one in France and one in the Netherlands, looking at slightly different populations, secondary progressive MS in uh, France with Anne Cabrat. And with these uh, criteria, no relapse for three years, no scan change for three years. And in the Netherlands with Ava Strebus, looking at individuals really who could be quite young, they're gonna have uh, probably uh, quite a bit more disease activity than we saw, because they're looking at anyone who's stable for at least five years, with no significant change, that is at least three new lesions on your brain scan or a enhancing lesion or, uh, and no relapse for five years. So slightly different populations uh, compared to ours, these studies will finish in the next several years. And um, I'm in active contact with, uh, with these uh, women in France, these neurologists in France and, and Holland. Um, these are the sites where the studies were done. Ours is at the top here. Uh, with all the principal investigators, all the coordinators, we would not be able to do this study without the in incredible hard work of everybody uh, in all these different sites. And we would acknowledge and thank 
the funders, PCORI, as I mentioned, and the National Mass Society, uh, who kicked in a substantial amount of money that allowed us to expand the number of sites when we really needed it. And of course, mostly importantly, to all the participants who stuck their neck out in order to participate in this study, not knowing what the result might show, and who are willing to be randomized. Um, and we, we really just can't do anything without their participation. We also had a steering committee, uh, Drs. Fox, Miller, Keister, and Cutter, um, who helped me answer whatever questions occurred during the study, like would we include somebody or not include somebody. The data safety monitoring board, every six months these guys met, guys and gals met. Uh, EM is one of our patients. Um, and these are either neurologists the first year or a, a, a statistician, Dr. McKenzie at Penn State. And every six months they said, is it, we asked them, is it okay? They looked at all the tape, they were unblinded. They saw all the data. We said, hey, can we continue the study or not? And they said, yep, you can continue the study because we did not, you know, there were no warning signs. And in fact, we didn't have warning signs at the end of the study as well. They said, you must stop the study. Here's our data team at University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, Central MRI scan reader, Jay Constantini at Cleveland Clinic, and our study monitor, Tara Gustafson, who went around all the sites to make sure that there's integrity with the data. This is a very important uh, position. And we really thank Tara, who's been doing this for about 25 years and is ex incredibly experienced. So thank you all for your attention. We really appreciate you uh, getting on today. Um, I'm, I'm gonna answer a few of the questions right now um, that will be related to um, these questions that were asked previously uh, before the talk today. And then I'll uh, try and answer as many as we can answer going forward. Um, there were quite a few questions that were specific to very unique aspects of one individual saying, hey, I'm on this drug, what should I do? I think it's really not appropriate in this context to try and answer those questions. I'll try and put those in the broader context of the uh, questions uh, that were asked and perhaps that would answer your question, but always go back to your provider and you can use this data to help you. Um, in addition, there were several questions um, asked about those who were diagnosed later in life, say over 55 or several over 60 or even 70. And that's not really what we studied here. We studied individuals who were primarily diagnosed um, before that. I might have some comments about that later, uh, but that's a separate issue. Um, uh, this really had to do with focusing on people who had been stable for a more prolonged period of time. Uh, one question had to do with why is there such a disparity between neurologists when, when patients talk to their neurologists about this? And I think the answer is pretty simple. Um, two factors at least. One, uh, doctors as well as patients might have a different view of risk and of uh, fear with regard to the potential discontinuation of disease modifying therapy. Uh, we had several different sites, Chicago, UCSF, uh, others, Northwestern, um, that said they would not participate in the study because especially a lot of their younger doctors uh, were uncomfortable taking people off medication. Those of us who are a little bit older and, and have followed people longer and also who have perhaps uh, practiced during a time when we didn't have these medications, uh, their comfort level was a little bit higher in terms of taking people off. But the main reason why was that we didn't have data. Uh, and um, now we have some data that we, we can say, this is what we see. And then you can make an informed decision as to whether or not this small increase or possible increase in uh, lesions on the brain scan uh, is important. Uh, would that inhibit you from going off medication or not? And this will be still a unique discussion that you have with your provider. But there, that's the reason why there is a different uh, view by one neurologist compared to another. Um, and um, there were a number of questions about risks of medications in relatively older patients with longer use of disease modifying therapies. And, uh, and uh, the basic issue is that everybody is different um, and uh, some specific disease modifying therapies may have somewhat different risks compared to others. And um, so some individuals may be older, some may be more disabled, some may uh, be using a more immunosuppressive medication. So for example, risk of the brain infection, PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, with those using tisovage and lenioc perhaps related products, 
uh, or tecfidarin related products, they have an increased risk perhaps of having this PML and the longer use and an older individual may be a high risk. That's an example of the risk changing and perhaps the benefit changing the opposite direction as people age. And this is the fundamental thing that we talk about all the time. What is the risk for that individual? Does that risk change over time? And also does the benefit of medication change over time? And you have to balance those two things out. Um, there are questions about rebound effect. And we know that there's a rebound effect when people go off of some therapies, especially Jelenia and Tysabri. Uh, and other medications in the family of Jelenia. Uh, we can't say from this study because there were so few uh, individuals who were on uh, either Jelenia or Tysabri, um, but we certainly didn't see with those that we had uh, that everybody who went off drug uh, had a significant rebound of disease activity. Uh, and so um, uh, in a variety of different studies, especially with Jelenia, because there have been a large number of studies looking at people who've gone off outside of a formal study like this and just looked at, hey, what happened to them when they discontinued? It is pretty clear that age is the most prominent factor with rebound, as well as just simple recurrence. Rebound is an excessive amount of disease recurrence. Uh, disease recurrence is just return of either scan changes or relapses, uh, but age is the number one factor in a variety of different studies. Uh, how, if at all, can age of diagnosis and age of disease activity be factored into decisions about discontinuing DMT? As I showed in that, in that uh, Innsbruck study, uh, a combination of age, disease duration, and um, what your MRI scan and relapses were uh, more recently um, uh, play a role uh, in how you would potentially do. Uh, and this study adds more information about that. There's no simple formula that says, if you have this, 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 and this, that you, you would actually have a whatever outcome. But the Innsbruck study uh, does give some highlights and shows that those three factors uh, are very important and you can use them all together to try to judge uh, risk. But there's no simple algorithm that defines that for everybody. Uh, a major important question that was asked was how durable is this? You know, this is only up to 22 to 24 months. Um, what happens, you know, over three years, five years, 10 years? And we simply don't know that. Uh, we have our own personal experience. Uh, I've had quite a few pa you know, patients, many, many more than 100, maybe close to 200, who have gone off drug outside the study. Uh, and uh, on the whole, my personal experience has been that this has been a durable phenomenon, but there are absolutely people who, when they go off medications, can have a relapse, just as there is for people who stay on a relapse, uh, stay on their scan, uh, on their disease modifying therapy, can have a scan or a relapse change. Uh, but the number is very low. Uh, that has been my personal experience, and that's what prompted, uh, in great part, uh, the wanting to do this study was really trying to actually document what that risk was. So the risk is low um, uh, and even over time, but um, with the groups in uh, Europe, in France, as well as in uh, Holland, we're gonna get together and try and look at all of our patients who've gone off drug and try and answer that question, as well as uh, the question as to different medications and how they play out with regard to um, the higher effective therapies versus the lower effective therapies. And a, a, an important question is, well, what happens if you go off your medication and you have a new problem? Well, you can always go back on. Um, you can also want to make sure, though, that it's not a pseudo relapse, as I referred to previously, uh, a, a sort of a transient worsening, maybe associated with infection or fever, uh, that then when you treat that, you go back to your baseline. That would not prompt going back on to a medication. Um, but certainly, if you had a true relapse or, or a substantial uh, scan changes, uh, a consideration to go back on medicine would absolutely be true. And I've never seen an insurance company, uh, for example, some people are concerned the insurance companies, once you go off, they won't allow you to go back on. Uh, that's never been an issue in my experience. Um, there was a question about insurance coverage, though. What about ha what happens at uh, 65? People want Medicare. Well, that does change things because Medicare funds things differently. You know, many people have a supplement that covers the 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. You're no longer able to get assistance from these companies if you have Medicare. Uh, there are rules against that with regard to uh, Medicare and Medicaid patients. So many patients get assistance for co-pays and deductibles. That becomes much more limited when you use Medicare, for example. So insurance does play a role. And in this study, those who continued medications, 6% um, of people uh, had to drop out because they lost or had a change in their insurance. Uh, 
Um, how is a patient followed when they stop taking their disease modifying therapy? There's no agreed upon formula or algorithm, but what I do is I check to make sure someone at baseline when they're gonna go off, that they're stable and their scan is stable. I check them for two years. I see them twice a year and we re-examine them and we check their scan at year one and year two. And after that, if the patient is stable, we see them every year and we scan them every two to three years. And uh, so the, the point of that is just because you're off doesn't mean we stop following, we continue to follow you. And actually in some respects may actually increase your monitoring. Um, Let's see, if you're not, uh, there were questions about um, people who had never gone on medications uh, and yet were now uh, getting somewhat older. Um, and the question was raised, should you start taking a medication potentially? And the answer is yes, if you have new disease activity, whether or not you're young or old, if you have significant new disease activity or risk of new disease activity, then you would potentially benefit from using these medications. Um, but if someone has never used a medication and they were diagnosed when they were 25 or 30 and now they're 60, uh, the likelihood that they're going to have new disease activity that would prompt them to want to consider going on a medication uh, would be relatively low. That likelihood is just low based on all the things we described in, this, in the talk. So uh, uh, I would say it would be fortunate that someone, if they did well with never being treated, I'm happy that they were well, uh, even, even though they didn't use a disease modifying therapy. Um, I wish that was always the case, uh, but unfortunately it's not. So um, the answer is the same. That is, if you have a risk or, or actually have shown new disease activity, you're potentially a candidate to use these medications. Will these new findings translate to new monoclonal antibodies? As noted here, we didn't have enough data to answer that question, but hopefully we'll be able to answer that with studies in the future. Um, we did not study lengthening um, the time interval between usage of medicine, especially for disease modifying therapies that are infused, uh, the IV drugs, uh, Tysabri and Ocrevus especially. There is some data to suggest the possibility you could have extended dosing of Tysabri now from four weeks to six weeks, and we're sort of routinely doing that now, and there's data supporting that. There's also some data from the pandemic. The pandemic was good for a couple things. Uh, one thing it was good for was that a large number of people missed their dose completely or extended their dosing interval. And there are multiple studies that show that really nothing bad happened when that occurred. And there's also a phase two trial of Ocrevus showing that after being treated for 18 months, when people were followed for another 18 months after that off drug, they actually did quite well. So it might be well, it might well be the case that we can extend the dosing of some of these medications. The related question that came up uh, as well was whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not, as opposed to simply stopping medication, would you potentially de-escalate? So let's say you're on Ocrevus, for example, and you're starting to have a drop in your, um, your, in your normal antibody levels because that can happen the longer you use Ocrevus and other related drugs like rituximab. So could you de-escalate, stay on a medication, but maybe go off that medication because we know if your antibody levels, your IgG goes down substantially, then you're at risk of a uh, significant risk of infection. So could you maybe de-escalate to something else uh, that doesn't carry that risk and still stay on a medication? And so we're, we're actually in the end stages of um, doing all the preliminary work to do a de-escalation study right now. And I think de-escalation is certainly one of the things that could be considered uh, going forward. Um, I'm highly interested in de-escalation as part of <clears throat> the same concept. The overall idea that we have in our practice is that we treat people very aggressively at the front end because that's when they need the most and have the greatest impact from that. But at the same time, uh, as people age, they may not need to use uh, a more highly effective therapy and we can transition them to something perhaps uh, less uh, effective, but perfectly adequate, and then ultimately to go off of medication. Um, and finally, I did wanna just uh, get to this issue of people who are diagnosed after the age of 50 or 60. After age 50, uh, uh, onset of symptoms after age 50 is about 8% of people ultimately diagnosed with MS. Uh, onset of symptoms after age 60 is less than 1%. Uh, we treat them the same. That is, if someone has significant new disease activity and if they have new risk of new disease activity, then they're a candidate to be used to be using these disease modifying therapies. Uh, but um, the data that exists uh, for treatment in individuals who are diagnosed later in life 
is that the medicines are just not as effective. There's a large Italian database that show that there's not much difference between those who are treated versus not treated in terms of a variety of different outcomes if they're diagnosed over age, uh, over age uh, 50 or 60. So uh, it's an individual like it is with everybody else. Uh, if there's significant risk of new disease activity, um, uh, then certainly potentially that would be the case uh, to consider a trial of disease modifying therapy and those with uh, later onset. The tougher question is what about someone with primary progressive MS diagnosed at age 55 or 60 and maybe had symptoms for five to 10 or 15 years prior to that. The data supporting use of the medications is modest at best in that population. And so uh, not clear exactly what to do with them. Uh, the BTK inhibitors that I mentioned previously, we're hopeful that they will offer a much better opportunity for treatment uh, for progressive MS patients in general, especially in older patients with some fixed or worsening disability. Um, and then, then finally, there was a question or two about uh, what about um, the relationship of therapies that are uh, complementary therapies, such as uh, stress reduction, uh, diet, exercise, uh, exercise, stopping smoking. Those are all important. And we uh, strongly uh, agree with using those when someone's actually even before they're diagnosed, but when they're diagnosed all the way through their life, and as well as when they go off therapy, but those are complementary approaches. And we do not view those as a substitute, but really as complementary to, and they are important. And we recommend those for everyone. So those are the uh, main questions that we have here. I'm going to um, unshare. You're, you're unshared. Oh, I'm, I guess yeah. I'm unshared. Sorry, I uh, just noticed that. And uh, actually, Kelsey, do we have anything that I haven't covered there in, in uh, the questions and answers that might be worth looking at? We did have a couple of study design questions. Sure. Um, wondering the three patients who had relapses without brain um, MRI lesions, yes. were spinal cord MRIs taken? Uh, no. And so that's all. That's a very good question. It's quite possible that. Um, uh, that they uh, could have had uh, spinal MRI scans, but they, um, as far as we are aware, they did not have MRI scans to the spine. And that's in fact where they could have had a lesion occur. So that's absolutely possible. And then another question on study design, um, why were people with cancer not included in the study? Uh, yeah, so people with cancer, uh, substantial cancers, not basal cell cancers, but substantial cancers, uh, within the last 10 years um, were excluded. That is common in a variety of different studies. It gets, gets to be more of an issue with an older age population, obviously. Um, and that's because they can have a variety of complications that might um, cause uh, mimics of multiple sclerosis uh, and just increase the adverse events and other things like that. So it is typical in all of these studies that you exclude people with any significant um, medical problems that might somehow alter the data. It, it, you know, it's a fine line though. We, we of course want to have something that's broadly representative and could, uh, could re really generalize to everybody. So it's always a question as to who you exclude and who you don't. But generally, uh, recent uh, significant cancers are excluded as is, for example, hypertension out of control, diabetes out of control, uh, major psychiatric illness out of control, those are typically excluded as we did as well. Um, and I know you mentioned there hasn't been an issue with folks um, kind of trialing going off DMTs and then insurance letting them go back on. Um, is there a concern as these discontinuation studies continue um, that insurance companies are going to use this information to start denying uh, coverage? Yeah, I've said from, the, from before the time I even wrote the grant, uh, I said to people that that was my, um, that was my nightmare fear <clears throat> that somehow insurance companies would utilize uh, the data uh, for their own benefit um, and would come to some conclusion based on whatever the data was that they would exclude covering people. Um, uh, I would argue that everybody is unique and they can use this information to try and decide is a trial going off their disease modifying therapy is reasonable for them or not. Um, but that no external source, especially an insurance company, should be making that decision for them. 
So uh, when we finish writing the paper, um, that will be that will be one of the last lines in the paper that no one should conclude from this that this is some strict algorithm that says someone with X, Y, and Z that they don't need to be on medication, their risk is zero, and that uh, they should be taken off medication. I, that was not the purpose of the study, uh, and I would uh, strongly refute that anybody can interpret this or even similar studies unless, unless the data is so overwhelming. Um, but I think we're never going to have data that is so overwhelming that would make any kind of argument like that. Thank you. And we are over time. So I want to thank everyone for your um, time and attention as well. Thank you, Dr. Corboy. Um, I did want to also share a couple of additional resources. Our next issue of INFORMS is on aging and MS, um, and it will include a, an interview with Dr. Corboy. Um, we did have a lot of questions today also um, that are better suited for our conversations on MS series, which is an hour and a half of a town hall Q&A. Um, so all of those more general symptom and disease questions that you guys have um, are perfect for that format. So I would encourage you make sure you're on our email list um, and we will be sending out notifications of the next events or you can find all of our education events by looking us up on Eventbrite. Just look up Rocky Mountain MS Center um, and that's where you can sign up for all of the things that we do. Uh, and then again, you'll be getting the recording of this webinar along with a survey link so you can let us know um, how you liked it and how we can improve future programs. Thank you.